I teach elementary children uh, digital literacy and keyboarding skills and basically how to not get in trouble on the internet. But now I'd be talking about some of the stuff that, um, that I've been doing with my Ubuntu home server. Um, I'm going to be talking about the experiences that I did, things that, it's using, uh, things that it's doing for me right now, a lot of things that I've learned throughout the process. When I started this, I was just an Ubuntu desktop user. And so really figuring out all these other services and how things work together is a large part of what I'm going to be talking about here. And then overall, I'm going to just sum it up and say that you should do it too. Everybody should. So when I started this project, I've been using Linux for quite a while. Um, I tried many different flavors, all sorts of desktop environments. Some of them really worked with my system. Some of them really didn't. I failed a few times, gloriously failed, and installing Arch. That's always fun. Succeeded once. That's if you count in Tergos. I count in Tergos. That's what this is all on. Um, and I've spent a good amount of time exploring what the Linux desktop has to offer. But I know that Linux has a lot more to offer than just the desktop, even though I still use it as a daily driver at home, at here, and also at work. I get my, um, my site-based text to look the other way because I'm not supposed to have Linux there. They don't care. Um, but I've even been able to uh, convince some friends and family to, uh, to transition over to Linux too. Very slow process, but some of the uh, web-based services have really helped out with that. Anyways, at the time, what I wanted to do, I didn't want to um, transition into a cloud service because I wasn't there yet. I wasn't there yet technologically. I really didn't know how things interacted there now, but I learned that throughout the process. So I wanted to do something with something that I already had so where if I ruined it, I'm not going to be out any money. I'm not going to be out any privacy. I'm not going to be out anything else. So I just worked with what I had. So yeah, I basically needed something that I could trash if I entirely messed up with it. But I did have a list of priorities, things that I thought that I could use a server for. I wanted to be able to have a central file system. I wanted to be able to have something that could run a couple of dedicated servers on it. Um, I really wanted to be able to get Steam dedicated server to run on there so I could put up some servers. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And I wanted to have something that allowed me to access a private network from anywhere else. And that's a big part of what I'm going to be talking about too. So I needed something to toy with and achieve some of these goals, and I had to read a lot as I learned. What I already had was an old Acer laptop, and it had a, um, an AMD E350, which is an APU. Any of you guys ever tried to get Linux to work on an APU? No? A few? Did it go any better than mine? It was terrible. <laughs> it's really hard to get kernel support for that. APU is just their um, AMD's attempt at the integrated graphics thing. And so most desktop environments that I could get on there, well, anything. Um, Nouveau wouldn't work on it. I couldn't get graphics drivers to get it to the native resolution. And so it just sat in my garage for a long time until I thought of the idea for this project. I'm like, oh, you don't need graphics for a server. So I threw it on there. And let's see here. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Sorry, I should have done bullet points. Um, so yeah, it really bugged me that I couldn't get to the native resolution, though. We'll get to that. So I started, but before I started, I had to choose what I was going to put on there. So at first, I thought that, well, a Linux server. A Linux ser server just really seems like it should be running on Red Hat, right? Or something close to Red Hat. That's, well, that's what I thought. Um, but I was unfamiliar with that at the time. What I was quite familiar with was Ubuntu, because I had started Ubuntu like a long time ago, back when they were in, um, in the budgie days. That's not too long ago. But like five years ago, so I had experimented with Ubuntu, and I had Ubuntu Mate on my laptops, all sorts of Ubuntu things. So I'm like, well, why not just stick with what you know? And so I threw Ubuntu on there. And yeah, really just not a whole lot of thought process went into it. I just stuck with what I was familiar with. So predictably, Ubuntu uh, was a really quick install. Um, just go through as usual. Only difference is that it was all through the alter the terminal and installed no desktop environment with it. The Ubuntu server package is actually very small. It was about, five, I want to say, five, 600 megabytes. And so I got there, and I had a wonderful blinking cursor just waiting there, blinking on the screen that was open, which is not exactly what I thought, what I wanted to have. I didn't want to have a laptop that just sat there with the screen up and a cursor always blinking there. So 
okay, problem number one to solve. I need to find a way to disable the screen because servers don't need to constantly have a client blinking there. Um, so that really wasn't too much. But first I had to get it connected to the network before I could attack any of that because I didn't want to work on it as a laptop. And so I just plugged it into my network and then I went and I plugged it into the network, went in, found my IF config settings, and found what IP it had been assigned by the DHCP. Then I could just SSH in and get handed there. And what I found is that the, the first thing that I found is that there's a trigger in there in Etsy, system D, and the login information as to what to do with um, when it hits that lid switch trigger. What's up? They call it handle lid switch, which just has to be set to ignore. And I'm saying a lot of these things. By the way, all of this is on everything that I'm saying and a little bit better because I wrote a script and now I'm ad-libbing because I feel it needs to be more lively. All of this is actually on my website too, so if you want to know any of these tools or any of these config settings that I'm talking about, it's down there, www.lumber-mike.com, which is actually hosted on this server, so don't all go there at once. It's just a, it's just a laptop. <laughs> Um, so the screen was something that I wanted to take care of right away. I could figure out that I could shut the lid, but that didn't turn off the screen either. So I'd shut it, and then I'd just see the glowing around the edges. So I still had another problem to get to. Um, I wanted it, the server to be low power and low heat, because I also didn't want to have to be constantly physically maintaining it, and I didn't have to worry about it if, I didn't want to worry about it if my cats came over and sat on it, whatever. We wanted it to be as low as possible. Um, and so I found that there is actually most Ubuntu, and I don't know about other environments, but most of them actually have a package install that has the Display Power Management Signaling Service, DPMS, which is pretty easy to turn off. I played around with it a few times. You can do it remotely. Pseudo DPMS off. Turns off the power management, turns off power to the display. So super easy once you got there, except for you don't want to have to do that every time the server reboots. All right, so um, I had to add it into rc.local, which is just a small little script that I understand runs every time that it reboots. And during the questions, please correct me on any of this stuff. I get there. I'm not a system admin. I'm just a amateur system admin now. You guys are too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, I'm too used to fifth graders. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, so I did that. While I was in there, I figured I'd also add in, in that rc.local, a couple of other things that I wanted to run automatically at startup as well, which I determined I'd just have a startup sequence every night. And that's just doing apt update and apt upgrade. And I actually did just add another one in there. What did I add recently? Oh, pihole, which I'll get to pihole in a little bit here. Okay, so we had it there. We had it manually running updates. Um, and then I had to move over to some of the networking side. I wanted to get a static IP for things because I knew I had to do forward ports and I would have to connect to it directly. And I didn't want to have to be changing every three or four days. And static IP was a little bit of a journey because the static IP um, really is dealing with consumer level router and so it was very difficult to get that to actually work. What I tried is I tried just going into, um, logging into my router, going to the, I don't know what it was, just logging into the router, going to my static IP settings, and it has a nice little button there that said add. So I clicked add. I entered in the MAC address. I gave it the static IP I wanted, and then it logged me out of the router. <laughs> I wasn't even on that one. And then I did it again, and it logged me out of the router. So I determined that Comtrend wasn't actually going to help me. <laughs> so as usual, we find a workaround somehow. So what I ended up doing is I went and I worked around, and I just went to the DHCP scope that my router had. And so I just scooted it up. It had assigned me to IP 192.168.1.10. So I only have like maybe 15 devices if you count all of our phones and tablets. So I just scooted it up so DHCP started at 192.168.1.11. And then I just turned off, uh, made it not look for DHCP on the server. So a workaround that works. Hopefully you don't have a Comtrend router so you won't have that problem. Maybe someday they'll update the firmware and it'll work, but I'm not counting on it right now. Okay, so then I had to go in and tell it to turn it around. So I had to go into some config files. Went to Etsy network interfaces, and that's where I got here to locate the um, 
look at Enterprise that I was working on, this resolution is not very good for that. Okay, so there's ifconfig. You guys kind of know what ifconfig looks like, hopefully. If you don't, type it in anywhere. It'll pop up something <laughs> like this. Give your interfaces, MAC address, um, and the assigned I IP address from your DHCP. Yeah, so, <laughs> what's that? That should be for, yeah. Uh, that'll probably give you more information if there's a verbose, but this is just, just the default ifconfig. Pops up for all of that. And I would highly advise not using the wireless on there, even though if you're using an old laptop like me, it has wireless, but that's really, you don't want that amount of traffic back and forth over a wireless network. Okay, so we got that. We got the static IP. I assume we're all good there. Um, then I had to go back into my router because I know it's going to be, I wanted to access it from externally. So then comes port forwarding, all sorts of fun stuff. And here's, um, first thing was just open up port 22. I wanted to be able to SSH in from all other places. And then it came very familiar with this because I tried to keep it as secure as possible, which means I didn't forward any ports more than I needed to. So I just started one at a time and then just add them in. Um, so I'll skip over the details of one of my really big mistakes early on, and that was, oh, well, I've, there's this thing called DMZ in there. I just don't have to worry about port forwarding at all. It'll just send everything there first, which apparently you are not supposed to do. Really freaked me out in there. I wrote a blog post about it because I went and looked through the logs, and there were like a million attempts from Chinese IP addresses trying to log in as root. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to deal with that, so we'll go there later. Um, yeah, just don't be ashamed of your mistakes. If you want to hear more about how I had to, how I was calling my ISP and saying that I was getting hacked by the Chinese and they need to block these email, these IP addresses, if I be a beer later, I'll tell you that story. <laughs> right. But also along that research path, let me to, um, let me to knowing that you're not going to be obscure or you're not going to be secure through obscurity, which is something that had been preached to me by a friend at some point. That really doesn't exist because there are computers that are scanning constantly and it's not really that difficult to find an open port. Simply setting your SSH to port 3456 isn't really making your obscure. Somebody can find that there's a pin coming back from that and then just start brute forcing. What you really want to do is really get RS RSA keys if you want to be secure and being able to access um, secure shell that way. So it's a little thing for that. Yep. Yeah, passwordless for most of it. Either that or I still use the password for mine sometimes for some of the things that I use for SSH. For local network and then internet login, just say the password altogether. That's what I do. Yep. That'll work. Um, so we get to, oh, some of the things that I put on after that um, whole adventure with all the Chinese IP addresses trying to get me. Um, a couple of the first packages that I got in there, SSH card and fail to ban which are the yeah, SSH card and filter band. SSH card is actually very, um, they're both work really well together. I didn't really want to just work on um, blocking them one way. I want to make sure that I have some, um, that's a fancy word for that. I want to make sure that I had it covered a couple different directions though. Um, so SSH card is fast and lightweight monitoring tool written in C language. I actually lifted this from Unix men's website where I found it, which is also a link on my blog if you want to look at there's but basically, it monitors and protects servers from brute force attacks um, using their logging activity. It's just constantly trolling the logs and looking for repeated attempts within a certain time period that you set up. And then it just temporarily adds it to, um, to the um, IP tables block list. And then it'll refresh every 24 or 48 hours or whatever. Very useful for that. Uh, fail to ban does it a little bit differently. Uh, fail to ban, also both of these are open source too. I don't think I'm talking about anything that's not open source. <laughs> okay. um, fail to ban does it by uh, just looking for things that are malicious. It's not looking for those repeated attacks. It's just looking for, again, looking through the log files, but it's looking for malicious signs, such as trying to use the same password multiple times, even from different IP addresses. So if you really forgot your password, it's going to block you out. But that's probably for the best. Um, there's a part about that. Something else I wanted to say about fail to ban. Can't think of it right now, so I won't let you make you wait while I think about it. 
Um, but two really good things to have on there, working back to back to kind of prevent some of that brute forcey stuff, make you feel a little bit more secure so that it's more useful to you in some of the applications that we're gonna be doing. So I was up and running then. I had myself a secure connection. I could get, I could block off all those people that were trying to hack me and I was scared of. Um, but we're gonna go through some of the packages that, I, that I'm using on a regular basis in just a few slides later here. But I started off with just using OpenSSH server, Samba server, and Docker. Even though at the time I really didn't have a plan for what I was gonna do with those containers. I just knew that from Linux Action Show, they were saying Docker every other word at that point. So I knew I had to have Docker, right? Um, so one of the first things that I did though is I got um, Samba server going and Samba server, if you're not familiar, it just opens up uh, Windows file sharing. This way I can share. It makes a, I think it's NFS. Change, does the trans, if somebody correct me if this is wrong, but I think it does the ext4. It makes it read it as an NFS system. Anybody good with Samba server? Okay, I'm gonna say that for now then. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, so basically you can just set up a folder that is shared with Windows devices. So I had Samba server, I uploaded, um, used SCP and just sent all over my entire music library, which was awesome because then I had network attack storage, attached storage. I could get there from anything, not just from my server. If I SSH into my server from work, I could access all my music files. And if I didn't want it sitting up on a cloud or I was worried somebody was gonna find all the stuff that I downloaded off of, uh, um, of LimeWire or whatever way back in the early 2000s, <laughs> It's, I can just pull the plug, it's my own server. I have physical control over it. Um, so I was pretty happy with that at that point. I even started to experiment around some more. Um, but again, not really knowing the use of Docker, I was just kind of putting stuff onto the, the operating system. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll throw up a web server, I'll download Apache, cool, Apache's there. Hey, why don't I try out this first few steps of Ruby on Rails, I'll set up a Ruby app. Hey, it's there, it doesn't like Apache, crap, okay. Uninstall Apache, get this going, and Nginx, everyone's going to Nginx, I'll do that, crap, undo that, undo that, and so it became a mess. I ended up getting all sorts of orphan config files and conflicting services that I could never really um, seem to get rid of properly. And so I ended up doing the fun thing that we all do with Linux at one point or another, kill it. <laughs> it's gone, start over. But you know, that's kind of the fun of it though with Linux is that a lot of the stuff, you can just quickly get it right back up there. You don't have to enter in the 25 pin key to get your license back or anything. So I nuked it. I put on Ubuntu Server 16.04 again. I uh, got my network and Samba server set up again. You installed Docker and then installed Cockpit. Another thing that I had heard about. We'll get to pretty quickly here. Um, and then went through the same steps except for at that point I knew I really needed to get into Docker because I knew enough about it to know that um, it prevented these kinds of problems. So I had my second iteration, which is the same thing that I'm using now. So overall, the first setup, I would say it was a pretty good success though. Um, I could use SSH Shuttle or KI4A, two really good apps that work well together. SSH Shuttle runs, um, runs pretty well on a desktop or a laptop to um, traffic, all of, send all of your digital traffic over to your server. KA4A does the same type of thing, but for Android. So it's just really cheap and easy VPN. Um, and I could access my media files with that too. I VPN'd in, VPN'd in, I could get that. And it stayed like this for a while because it was working and I didn't need anything else. I thought, you know, that's all that I really need the server for. Yeah. You've got quite a, a lot of pretty advanced stuff on here. Why haven't you gone with something like the essence rather than your uh, consumer grade router? Um, um, yeah, money mostly. <laughs> yeah, because everything at this point was um, was free or salvaged. I mean, the laptop was sitting in my sitting in my garage, and it it can work on the router that I have for my ISP. But yeah, believe me, that's on my radar and that's on the to get list. <laughs> Some better quality hardware there. Um, so once I got cockpit in there, it really opened up a lot of stuff that I could do quickly with Docker, though, because um, I could pull down. One of the first images that I pulled down was um, was Minecraft, and Minecraft is pretty close to click and go on it. Uh, not quite, though. Um, so overall, I had a handle, 
a really good handle on network functions, but it only had a single IP, so I had to make some choices. I couldn't run multiple web servers. Um, well, I could. I would just have to indicate different ports that I'm querying it on. But I couldn't have multiple things on port 80 or multiple things on port 443. It just really didn't play nicely. And I knew that I had to get all my traffic through, uh, through my server encrypted for one of the next things that I wanted to get set up. And so I had to start dealing with SSL and TLS encryption, which fortunately became really easy. Um, so first thing I did is purchase a domain. And if you haven't ever done this, you probably should, especially if you're looking at doing any of this stuff, because it's a lot easier than trying to memorize an IP address. And if you're directing anybody else there. And domains are really cheap right about now. Um, if you have a domain, then you can just pick a subdomain to forward to static, or if you already have control over a domain, like some other website. If I run a website for, um, for my wife, and I wanted to have something up on the cloud service that directed to something that's not related to mine, so I just created a sub uh, subdomain for it, you know, so and so dot so and so dot com. It's really useful for that. Um, Google can register domains now, and I would say Amazon, but the one that I had was on Namecheap, which is, as it says, just pretty dirt cheap. I don't really like their web hosting services anymore, but their domain service is still one of the very lowest out there. So once you have that, an SSL certificate is actually very, very easy if you're using the EFFs tool. Um, now they have CertBot, which if you're running an Ubuntu server, they have a package for. So you just download it, and you type in, type into your terminal, CertBot, enter, and it walks you through it. You just need to put in the name of your domain, and then it does most of the rest of it for you. It really couldn't get much easier for getting that, um, getting a self-signed certificate set up. One thing that I do want to do is I want to, I haven't done this yet, but since they recently have wildcard certificates out, because that's something that I'm running into is that if I'm running a subdomain, um, like lumbermike.com, I also have my resume up on resume.lumbermike.com, which is a subdomain, um, but there you might get an SSL encryption error because the, the domain is www.lumbermike.com. It's the same server. So I'm going to have to get that wildcard thing updated in there. That should take care of that if you choose that option. Uh, let's see here, so it to automatically forward, yep. Anyways, it's pretty straight through there. The one thing that I wanted to use SSL for was NextCloud, because I wanted to get NextCloud up so that I had more of a personal cloud service, more so than just connecting through a VPN and go, or um, SSH, SSH shuttle, connecting through a tunnel to be able to get up my network storage. And NextCloud was probably one of the easiest things that I could have set up, especially once I had SSL encryption set up. It won't even let you try if it's not there. Um, they have an official um, Docker. They have an official Docker hub for it. I have a little bit on my script about why I don't trust Google with my information or whatever and why Nextcloud is good, but I think most of you guys might have similar ideals. Anyways, yeah, you just uh, Nextcloud I downloaded right in right in Cockpit because it didn't require any special launch conditions or anything. You can actually just go to Cockpit if you have Cockpit installed, which I didn't make a slide about. Um, Cockpit does make launching and managing your um, Docker containers pretty easy. Yeah. Quick comment. Right after this, I think Yoast from Nextcloud is having a session on how to install on Nextcloud on a Raspberry Pi and devices like that. And I have a session tomorrow on how to do self-hosting your own hardware with a whole bunch of other applications like Next Nextcloud on Android. Just cross-reference. Awesome. <coughs> and more information on similar, and hopefully I'm not too far off from what you're going to be talking about. <laughs> we not. So yeah, um, Nextcloud, like I said, the um, Docker image is really easy to set up, and you can actually set it to have persistent storage. So if you blow away your Nextcloud instance, the data is still on your, on your laptop or still on your server. That stuff doesn't go away. Uh, let's see here. I covered that. Okay, so next thing I threw up was Ghost. I wanted to run a blog, which I'm still kind of running a little bit. I post on there when I feel like I have something to, something there. I don't get a whole lot of traffic there. It's more note taking. But I wanted to have something there and I wanted to have the experience of setting it up. And since I've been able to use Ghost to set up things for, um, for like my parents' nonprofit or my wife's blog, and it's just quick and easy. And they also have a really nice container image for it. So, um, what I had problems with the container, though, is that it was, it was kind of a pain in the neck to get in and do any editing in there because you would have to actually 
connect to the container and run bash on it, and then run, it would connect as root in the container, and I didn't want to be root, and so I had to install sudo, but then I wanted to do some text editing in there, so I had to install nano to the container, and the container started getting pretty big. And so I opted for Ghost, since that's something that I wanted to stick around a little bit, that I decided that that's probably something that I didn't want to run on a container. I wanted to run that on bare metal of the server. But I'm glad that I had it as a container first, so I had that option. If I had run it on bare metal and wanted to go the other way, I'd have a lot of work to undo. So it's good to experiment with that and start off with that anyways. Um, so yeah, I just uninstalled it, had it there, and put it on bare metal. But that also meant that I had to kind of change Nextcloud a little bit because the Nextcloud, then the Nextcloud web interface wouldn't work because the Ghost web interface was working. Kind of back and forth, at least until I upgrade to having multiple IPs, which I don't see myself doing because I can just throw stuff up on the cloud now. But it's, it's all learning. And that's what this talk is really about. It's just what I have learned. Have you looked into virtual hosts where you can have more than one domain on a single IP? I have not. That sounds just like a good idea. Just a suggestion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Virtual hosts. Uh, let's see here. Um, and Ghost, since I started playing around with Ghost, they have launched the Ghost CLI, which actually makes a lot of managing, a lot of things managing, yeah, managing a lot of things on Ghost really easy to do. The Ghost CLI, you can easily start or stop the Ghost service. You can run updates on it. You can grab new themes all just through their own command line interface without having to um, work back and forth. The only pain in the neck is really just getting it initially set up with the email service, uh, setting up the information for, um, for like MailChimp, which I ended up using. You, have to, you just have to go into a JSON file and throw some things in there, but then you, you also have to um, add a lot of synthetic DNS records to your domain, and there's kind of a learning curve there. MailChimp does, or no, Ghost. Ghost actually has the steps better documented for doing that than MailChimp does. Um, I didn't think I needed it at first, but when, back when I was first playing around with Ghost, I had forgotten my password for it, and that, that was it. Forget your password, you click the forget password button, it doesn't do anything, because I never set up the email. It doesn't send it out anywhere. Um, so that's something that you really want to do if you want to save anything off of there at all. Um, so after lots of reading, all of this is just really reading. Everything that I had done up to this point and made mistakes on could have been avoided by me reading the documentation. <laughs> but I didn't because I did what so many, um, so many tech people I know do is you get something and you play with it. <laughs> you want to take it out of the box and play with it right away and then you mess it up and then you go to the instructions. <laughs> Right, so. Seems perfectly reasonable. I don't understand what you're saying is wrong. Yeah, with really. <laughs> <laughs> Which, in this case, it was perfectly fine with. I just ended up kicking myself later because I was undoing a lot of the work that I had done. Um, OpenVPN is something that I use a lot, actually, and it works really well with um, some of the other apps that I'm going to get to very quickly because I'm yabbering more than I expected to. Um, but OpenVPN did have a pretty much just click-and-go container. You could pull it down from... Uh, pull it in from cockpit, or you just pull it from command line. You do have to go, after you pull it in though, before you launch it, you do have to generate your RSS, RSA keys, which getting them was a little bit tricky. So you have to know a little bit about using um, SCP and doing the secure copy to send the information over, or if you already have it, if you already have like Nextcloud set up or something, then you can just put it into, uh, put the RSA keys into that folder. Well, you have to have some way to be able to get the data off of there so that you can actually get the proper key so that you can log into it. Um, but there is an official, um, an official container for OpenVPN, open, open but the one that I found that actually had better documentation for it was by Kyle Mana, which I have a link to on my blog here. It's M-A-N-N-A. Uh, um, Kyle Mana slash OpenVPN on Docker Hub. Because he does have really good documentation for it, and he's actually pulling from their official Git repository, and it's building the Docker file from that. So you get RSA set up, and then I have 2048-bit um, RSA security for it. And I use that, I'm using it right now, all the time, just simply for the ease of mind. And that's really one of the big things that I ended up using my server for. Anytime I am not at home, my traffic is from home, which works really well when I actually, um, after I set it up with the information, or with the settings, to forward my DNS requests as well. 
Because in my mind at the time, there were two things that I could be tracked on, and that was what websites I was going to if I was pulling the request from somebody else's router, and then the, uh, the IP addresses, and then the DNS requests that are going out. So if you forget the DNS request part, then you're getting the DNS from wherever you're actually connected. So they can still see where you're trying to go, they just can't see the data that's coming back from it. So DNS requesting, forwarding is also very useful. Which brings me to Pi-hole. Anybody use Pi-hole? Kind of a couple people? Pi-hole needs a lot more attention. It is awesome. It's something that has really pushed me to use my server full more. And, and that's because Pi-hole does DNS-based ad blocking. So it blocks it before it ever gets to your computer. And so I use Pi-hole um, every time I connect a device to my server, every time I connect through VPN or connect through SSH. Pi-hole runs because I'm sending my DNS data over there. And it just you can manually add in lists of different, uh, there's a lot of lists out there, just lists of different uh, domain names serve, domains that serve ads that'll just get blacklisted out of there. So right now I have, I think, like 2.4 million unique domains that are being blocked. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't believe there's that many out there, but they have a really neat, um, they have a couple of really neat ways to see it. And one here is the command line based one where they actually go through and show, it's hard to see, but it shows my, uh, some server statistics as well, my RAM usage, hard drive usage, CPU usage, um, but it also shows how many ads have been blocked. And the local, Local query. Yeah, how many ads have been blocked? At this point, 39% of all DNS requests had been blocked as ads. And I wasn't trying to go to any websites and see that they were blocked. All the stuff that's going on in the back end that you have no idea about. Have you noticed any so, delay at all in your browsing? Um, the DNS, it does add a tiny bit of time to the DNS. But um, one thing that I want to add to here that I didn't, because it requires going through the pie hole setup again, which is quick, I've just been lazy and have been getting this presentation together, is getting the new 1.1.1.1 um, DNS going. Has anybody tried that? Jumped on that yet? Found one? No, Linus just, um, Linus Tech Tips just posted a video about it, so I'm sure it'll be out there everywhere soon. Uh, it's supposedly a very fast um, DNS service, but right now all of mine is, when you set up Pi-hole, you set it up and then you tell it what DNS service you actually want it to go to after Pi-hole. So all the requests in my, within my network go to here. It runs it through the list, and if it matches the list, it doesn't do anything with it. If it doesn't match the list, then it's okay. It sends it out to where, whatever DNS you have set up, which right now I have open DNS. And so it's, it's not noticeable, really, from when I actually type something in and when it sends back. So are you confused about um, what ads you're blocking? A lot of the stuff that gets blocked from Pi-hole um, are like old school banner ads. This isn't blocking to the server. Yeah. I still don't understand what you're doing with it. Okay. Um, well, I would check out the the Pi-hole documentation for that, or maybe I could walk through it a little bit, um, a little I bit more still later. Understand. If you didn't have Pi-hole, where would you get these ads? They would come from the domains that are being, no, no, where the ads no. are being hosted if you on. Didn't Your destination is a web browser. Your web browser? Yes. All the traffic being routed through the server. Okay. Yeah, everything, every internet request that I have is being routed through there and being filtered. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The advertising would come from separate domains. Okay, sorry, I didn't make that clear. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Do you know the relationship between the Pi-hole DNS blocking and the blocking that you block Origin, the ad blocker does? There, um, there is some a little bit of crossover, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot because I still I still run ad blocker, I still run ad block throw, and I still run ghostery to block scripts, and they still get lots of stuff. Um, Pi-hole does not block ads that are served through like YouTube. I still get YouTube ads on there, and so I still need the ad blocker to go with it. So you block Origin as actually generic blocker, and it blocks things at the request level. I'm not sure if it does DNS blocking, but I would imagine it does, and the default 
blocking rules that it has comes from something called the easy list, which is what Adblock Plus uses. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. what Pi-hole uses, but that may answer your question of, you know, where do you get the list of sites that are blacklisted? It's uh, from the easy list, it's called. Okay. Yeah. Um, that might be something that I have to add in, because Pi-hole does have, um, you can add, you can manually add uh, servers to it, or you can add lists, and I've added a lot of lists there, but I might have to look up that easy list and see if I can add that there, too. These lists are maintained, right too. Yeah, like they are. A lot of these are made, a lot of the lists that I have on there are maintained. I forget how many that I have, but it's some um, like 50 lists that I got off of a, a Reddit post. And so the, one of the good things about Pi-hole besides blocking ads is that it also, uh, it saves on data. If I'm actually using my data on my phone, it blocks all that stuff before it ever actually gets sent to the cellular carrier. Because it filters it out there. Um, so um, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip over Minecraft a little bit. Hopefully everybody's okay with that. Minecraft server, something you can throw up on there? Mine test superior. Yeah. <laughs> Microsoft killed it. Any Roblox fanboys here? Yeah. <laughs> they did. Um, Sorry, Microsoft. Anna. Yeah. And into Docker. I mean, the biggest thing that I can tell you from my experience with Docker is that you have to go, you have to go to Docker Hub before you pull something down. It'll be really tempting to go into, if you have cockpit in there, to just type something in and download it and run it. But about 75, 80% of the time, it's not going to work because it requires some other setup within that container before you click, before you click to run it. Plus, there's a lot of things that automatically configure in there that you might not want. You might want to have some spe um, specific uh, restart conditions on there. Like if you're setting your server, like, like I did, to reboot every night, then you want to make sure that your containers also come back as soon as it boots, so you're not manually having to restart everything. And so some containers have it or not. But really, just go to the Docker Hub pages and read through the readme files. A lot of them really just have, um, a lot of them have some pretty good documentation, especially for everything that I've talked about so far. So I still use, I still use Cockpit normally to get the image. And so after I get the image, then I can just um, SSH in there and go through the command line stuff of sending the Docker commands there and changing the restart conditions and all that. Um, let's see here. So I had Minecraft. I had Steam CMD, which I'm not running Steam CMD anymore. I was for a while, but um, if you're not familiar with Steam, Steam's a gaming, uh, it's really a DRM now. But they do have a couple of games, Counter-Strike and Team Fortress. And I really wanted to have a Team Fortress 2 server up and running so I could play it with my kids. But it, the Steam CLI is kind of a pain in the neck. Uh, it's a very cumbersome, messy process. It can work on there. Uh, but at the time that I was playing around with it, they didn't have a Docker container for it. So it had to run on bare metal. And there was, um, and what I was really unhappy with were the, the AI presets in there for being able to have bots playing with you. And there's a lot of mods that you can add for that, but it didn't really, it wasn't easy to do, honestly. And I, and my kid lost interest in the game by the time I got around there, so. Because <laughs> now it's all Minecraft or Fortnite, so. Get there. Okay, uh, to this summary section here, things that I've learned. Overall, really, is that um, if you're not 100% certain on how to use an application or a service, use, use a container. Use a container and read through the readme. Do as much reading as you can on it and just try the steps. That way if they don't work for the container, it's easy. You just remove the container, keep the image, do it again. Try something different. Um, second thing that I had learned, and it probably should have been the first, is that best practice security is a must, especially if you're running anything like this. If you're sending your traffic there, you wanna be secure anyways, so why not make it as secure as you could possibly be? Right, make sure that you're using, um, use UFW. I didn't really talk too much about the firewall, but I have UFW running to match every port that I am forwarding and to deny everything else. Right, so make sure that you're using some firewall. Uh, don't use the DMZ. Again, that's a beer story. That's not a now story, but it's fun. <laughs> um, and if you don't want a fun home project to become a chore, make sure that you're scheduling things using, uh, using cron. And schedule your update jobs, schedule your, uh, your restarts so that you're not running into um, issues between package updates and between kernel updates or having to do all this stuff manually. It just makes sense, especially since you're not really running in a production environment, it's okay to take it down for however much time as you want. Okay, so my favorite uses to summarize, um, I really like using my VPN 
I use OpenVPN or I use KI4A, uh, which is, wait, what's that on the first picture? I have them there. Oh, well, there's OpenVPN. OpenVPN or KI4A, everywhere that I can't use OpenVPN because there are some places, uh, like at my school or in the Wi-Fi where they do not, something about the way that they have it channel breaks the SSL encryption for OpenVPN, and so I can't actually connect to it. However, I can connect using port 22 to KI4A, so I have two different channels. Gen generally, if one doesn't work, the other will work. So I can still connect and I can still use a VPN-ish service. I can use that in conjunction with Pi-hole to block that, or I can use it just so that I can send a message on Facebook because the school blocks Facebook. <laughs> Either way. Um, I use Samba Server a lot, especially in con conjunction with those. I could use that. Um, I'm going to rush to the end because otherwise I'm not going to have time for questions. Yeah, but overall, you should definitely do it, um, especially if you're not that experienced with, with servers. It gets you a lot of information. It gets you a firsthand experience that you don't get from sitting in a class. And you don't really get from in a lab because then you're doing somebody else's project. It's a lot more meaningful, and you'll learn a lot more if it's your project, if it's the stuff that you want to do. And that's what I found, and I know as an educator, that if it's not personal, you're not going to remember it, and you're not going to progress from it. And overall, that's what I really liked about this, is that it's progressed me so much in what I can do um, technologically, and hopefully in explaining it, although we'll see. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I will second that. When I was preparing for this, um, I had submitted this talk, and then when it got accepted, I was like, okay, I'll just write down what I remember. <laughs> 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 Nothing. I pretty much had to redo it again just so I would have the notes for it and remember the order I did things in. So yeah, I will definitely second that. Um, any questions? Anything I have a else? Minecraft script server specific question. Okay. What happened with the new release of Minecraft and Minecraft server for Linux? Can you still run a Linux Minecraft server? Yeah. And yeah. Use yeah. The current yeah. client? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank God. You can. Thank God, our household <laughs> is safe. Yeah, you can. <laughs> for at least another week. Yeah, it works with no Microsoft. It works with desktop. There isn't one that works with mobile though. For running a local mobile server, that's still all Microsoft controlled. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, you wrote that you are running blogging software on your server. Yes. Uh, to speak to this gentleman's point, did you actually, you made a good point. Uh, did you at, ever, at any any point consider blogging your process as you're learning? That way not only do you have notes, but you're sharing with other people and sometimes you might be able to get feedback on what you might have done differently. I did. I actually, oh, kind of. <laughs> I started, and I'm going to go to the... Oh, I'm actually not connected to the internet here. That's, I was going to pop it up and show you. But yes, I started. Oh, it's at the end. Okay, so I started. I wrote a blog about the very first time that I set it up and how I set it up and then didn't do anything again for like six months. There's a lot of things that these things go. But yeah, that would be a very good thing for, uh, you know, for future prospective home server owners to do is set up something like that first, and then you have a good spot for documentation. Uh, but run the backups too. <laughs> run the backups on your blog. It's a very small file where it just stores all the um, all the text information you've entered in. Okay. Yeah. What are you doing with backing your server? What's that? What are you backing your server up with? Um, DD. Yeah, I don't have an automated backup process. I just have a whole bunch of a whole bunch of old hard drives that I have, and every once in a while I'll go and just um, plug them in externally and run DD. Otherwise, I have a backup of the, uh, like for my blog, I just will copy those backup files over to there and I still put up on Google Drive. No you can't escape it. No <laughs> What's that? No RSync or FTP? No, not yet. I don't think it's in, that important yet. Okay. Can you run this in a KVM virtual or, or in VirtualBox? Um, you know, you probably could. The only thing I would think about is you would have to do a lot more um, configuring of uh, the ports and stuff with the bridge where that gets the network co connectivity. Oh, because okay. you'd have to bridge every external protocol that you're sending in, every, every port that you're... Yeah. yeah, unless you want all traffic passed over there, which... 
which I have heard of some people have set up um, PyHole in a virtual environment, and they've been able to still use that as a DNS. But, but yeah, yeah. Personally, I like I chose to go with this option though because I like having it separate. I mean, this laptop has a very small power draw. I don't have to keep my desktop on the whole time. Well, how small a power draw? What's that? How much power? Um, I've never measured it actually. My Raspberry Pi uses two watts. Well, yeah, that would <laughs> that would be a lot less. Yeah, Pi Hole is meant for Raspberry Pis, but with the other stuff, um, I don't know. I suppose you could with a Pi. Yeah, your laptop's probably if you have a 19 watt power supply, it's probably only pulling that rarely, and half the time it's probably pulling almost nothing at all. Yeah, I don't notice it at all on my power bill. So. <laughs> <laughs> Make my kids leaving lights on overnight do a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> and if you bring it on the laptop, you have a backup. Yep. <laughs> you have, you have under, under full power. Okay, so if you have any more questions about use cases or whatever, um, you can find my email on there, or you can find me anywhere around here. I'm very happy to talk about it. Cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah.